God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. And if the stars are made to worship so loud, I can see your heart and name. Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and 
So now we will come to our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Psalms 19. All around us are signs and wonders, fingerprints of the Creator. Praise be to God. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalms 24. All around us we find life. All the created world is related to us. Praise be to God. Come, let us dwell in God's work of art. Here is this wondrous world. We are not alone. We share this life in the heavens and the earth. With the waters and the land, with trees and grasses, with fish, birds, and animals, with minerals and creatures of every form, and with all our brothers and sisters. Praise be to God. God is good, and everything God makes is good. Praise to the Creator of all that is, seen and unseen. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, kids. A beautiful Sunday morning. Glad you are here. So glad you are here. So today, our story comes from a play that's called God's Big Old Blue, which is about the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, and Adam and Eve. Hmm, what should I call you, you freshwater, sw swishy, swimming thing? I should call you a sarcastic French head. Yes, swim away, sarcastic. French head. A frog? Oh, I see your frog, but I'm not going to call you a frog. That's too easy. What about a mountain chicken? Yes, to call you a mountain chicken. Now hop away, you mountain chicken. Couldn't you just call it a frog? Wow, you're not a hyena or a lizard or giraffe, but you're something way better. Ooh, I like that. Hi there, with an E, you ever, letter V, valuable, E, effervescent. <gasps> Tell me more! Or with another E, you efficient, V, very, E, amazing, but that's with an A, but you can put an E there. If you just use the first three letters of all the words that you said, it's me, E, B, E, Eve. Yes, I should call you Eve. <gasps> He's a genius, everyone. Now, Eve, where did you come from? God created me from you while you were napping. Wow, that's what I call a power nap. Well, Adam, 
Since God gave us dominion over everything, we need to get busy. We've got a long line of animals ready to get names. I mean, like, yeah, like really, can you, can, can you just like really, like hurry this up? I need a name. Maybe you can find a name that's simpler, maybe an octopus? Because sarcastic French head is just not working out for me. I think that we should begin with the smallest to the biggest. With those animals, we can start with creatures that crawl around like this. I don't need no directions. What is it with men and not wanting directions? Genesis 1, 6 through 10, 27 and 31. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and so it was. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw it was good. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Genesis 3, 4 through 7 and 9 through 14. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed you are above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now we have come to the time for the sermon. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, or our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I've titled today's sermon, Did Eve Get a Bad Rap? So as a question, you probably know the answer already. This is not going to be a male bashing sermon or a libertarian female liberation type sermon. This is going to be unpacking the story of Adam and Eve and their creation, as well as looking at creation and looking at the creation of man and woman. So there's three things that I'm hoping we'll cover in today's sermon. The first is that when God created humankind, God called it good. Just as when God created everything else, 
God called a good. That humankind is created in the image of God. And we're going to unpack a little bit about what it means to be created in the image of God. And then I want to cover, was Eve really the cause of the downfall of humankind? So in this morning's scripture, we took a look at some of, of the various things and God creating. When God created the heavens and the earth, God created water, soil, animals, and especially when God created man. At each point in that creation story, God saw what God created, and God saw that it was good. And that is important to understand. God saw that it was good. At no point in that creation story did God say it was bad and recreated it. God said it was good. But no point in that creation story do we ever see that God created evil. Nowhere is evil created. And that's also something that we have to keep in mind as we go throughout our study of the Bible. All the way through Genesis and any other book in the Bible, we have to understand God never created evil. That everything that God creates is good. From that pesky little mosquito to the terrifying things of spiders and snakes and tigers and bears to the beautiful things of flowers and humankind. God said those were good. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? So what are some of the words that come to your mind? To be created in the image of God. When I ask this question of many, or when you look at pictures that represent what it looks like to be created in the image of God. We kind of see what we see in the mirror, right? Or when we look at the Western version of Jesus, it's a white male, long hair with a beard. But let's step back a minute and let's think about where Jesus was born and what part of the country that was, or the, I mean, part of the world in Palestine, folks. You don't see white, fair skin in Palestine. You don't see dark, long hair. Matter of fact, Jews at the time of when Jesus was born would never have been caught with long hair. They were dark skin. They probably had short hair and they probably did have facial hair. And if somebody like me were to look in the mirror, I certainly would not see a man. And what about our friends who are of the LBGTQIA community? What do they see? And what about our friends who are brown skin? versus black skin. And what do we see from our Native Americans when they look in the mirror? And what about our friends and our neighbors and our brothers and sisters who were born a little bit differently than, our, than us, who may be a little bit genetically form differently, a cleft lip, 
Maybe they're missing limbs or hands or feet. Maybe they have Down syndrome. They too were all created in the image of God. We need to understand that. We have to make sure that we understand that being created in the image of God is not what's being reflected in the mirror, but what it means to be created in the image of God is what God stands for, which is love. The most ultimate type of love that is beyond our understanding. And why is that beyond our understanding? Because how many of us would have gone to the cross to die for somebody else's sins? How many of us would have had that kind of love? That, when we talk about being created in the image of God, means that we are a reflection and a representation of God's humanity in the world. Don't forget that Jesus was both human and divine. And what Jesus left as the ultimate commandment to us was to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as we would love ourselves. God loves us back. God is there all the time, no matter what. When we're mad at God, when we forget about God, when we need God, when we think we don't need God, God is there with this love, always there. We never have to ask for it. It is just there. It is God's grace that is there. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. It's reaching that level of perfection of love. We never hear that God appeared in a certain way in a human form to anybody. To Moses, it was a fire in a bush bolt of lightning to Paul. It was various ways. It was wind. It was whatever. Even when God appeared in the garden, it was never told how God appeared. Other than love. So let's keep that in mind, what it means to be created in the image of God. It is not what is coming back to us in that mirror. And then when we think about when Jesus came to earth, what Jesus did was to demonstrate that love, that grace, that mercy, and that forgiveness and what justice looks like. And that's what we are supposed to follow. That's what we are supposed to do. That's how we represent God's love. And that's how we should walk through the world. So if Adam and Eve were created in that image of God, what does that mean? So let's go back to our scripture readings today. And let's start with first what it means that when God created human being. In the Hebrew Bible, it says that God created Adam, A-D-H-A-M. In Hebrew, that means man, mankind, male, female, red, ruddy, earthy. 
And when you think about it, when we read it in the Bible, mankind was created from the earth, from the dust, right? Jesus breathed into life, into this person, into this mankind, this male, female. And that word from Adam, A-D-H-A-M, was made from Adminha, A-D-M-A-H, I'm, si I'm sorry, A-D-H-A-M-A-H, which is out of dust. Now let's take a third look at this. Where was Eve created from? So Adam was taken to the garden was given all these things on earth. Just look, here I am on my farm. I have got so many animals. I've got trees. I've got flowers. I've got a lot of the things that were named in the Bible. I've got water. I've got fish. I've got birds on this farm. But God still noticed that Adam did not have a companion that matched Adam. So Eve was created. But where was Eve created from? From Adam's rib. And from there, we take the story that because it was she was created from Adam's rib. That means that she is to stand beside her, that she is his helper, that she is second to him. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that. First, let's take again, go back and look at what Ad M means in Hebrew, male and female. And let's take a look at the line of the succession of creation. Eve comes from a rib from Adam. Adam comes from dust. Dust comes from the creation of earth. The creation of earth comes from the chaos, from the creation that God made. Eve is the culmination of all of creation. She is the last thing created. She is good. Let that sit for a minute. Let's be silent and think for a minute what that means. The culmination of all of creation. So let's go to the garden. And let's talk about that fruit that was eaten. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it was actually an apple. We're sort of taught that in Sunday school. No reason. It was just a fruit. And we're taught about a serpent. The tells Eve Did God tell you not to eat from the tree of knowledge? Now Eve says, yes, but let's unpack this a little bit. Let's say that that's not quite accurate because if we back up and we look at when Adam was created, God took him into the garden. And when he took him into the garden, God told him not to eat from that tree or he would die. 
That is the only place in the Bible that we see that. God never told Eve directly. Not once. Nor do we ever see or read where Adam tells Eve directly. It's just inferred. Somehow she has knowledge of not eating from that fruit. But Eve tells the serpent, yeah, we've been told that, and we've been told that we are going to die if we eat from that fruit. So the serpent tells her, no, you won't die. That's not what God meant, really, is what he's saying. And then we're told, when you read that passage very closely, Adam is there. Adam is with Eve. Right there when the serpent's talking to her. But we don't hear from Adam at that point. Adam doesn't say a word. And Eve takes of the fruit. And she hands it to Adam, who not... To, who, I'm sorry, who does not say a word. He does not object. And he is the one that was directly told by God not to eat of the fruit. He was the one told directly. So Adam doesn't say anything to the serpent. He doesn't tell Eve, don't do this when the serpent's talking to him. And then he says, no thank you to Eve. He doesn't say that. He just eats of the fruit. And then, this is the reason why this is the tree of knowledge. Their eyes are open. And when the Bible says they see their nakedness, nakedness, what they mean is they now have the knowledge. They understand everything like God understands everything. They understand reproduction. They understand life and death. They understand mortality. They understand how the universe works. They no longer live in this idyllic place of the Garden of Eden. That is an incredible death. Can you imagine? It's like a child understanding Santa doesn't exist anymore. There's no Easter bunny. Or the tooth fairy's not going to bring them any money when they lose a tooth anymore. It is these incredible things that we believe in and all of a sudden we don't believe anymore. Those are minor analogies to what really happened to Adam and Eve, but that's what happened. All of a sudden, everything they believed in was gone, except for God. And remember, still, God said his creation was good. Just because they ate from the tree does not mean that God did not think his creation was still good. He still believes that. And we know that even as we begin to, as we continue to read the Bible more and more. We know that God still believes in humankind and he still is trying to help them and save them and get them back to the same point as when he originally created Adam. So I raise the question, is Eve really the reason for original sin? Because when I read the story, I see Adam standing right alongside her. Not saying a word, but sure taking part in the process. I think they're both at fault. But I also think that this is part of the story. Because let's remember that the Bible is a story of a people and a place and a time trying to get to understanding their God. And this is God meeting them at this place and that time. So let's go on a little bit further. <clears throat> when we talk about, when the Bible starts talking about the pain that 
is going to happen to the women and childbirth and all of this, and then how man is going to be cursed by the earth. Let's remember that man, the male version, came from earth. Now the earth is going to give him problems in the farming, in the agriculture. And the woman, the culmination of creation, the one who will continue to bring creation forward through the childbirth process is going to feel pain in that process. Just as God feels pain every time his creation doesn't move forward in the way that he desires it to. This is why when we say we're created in God's image, we're always striving for that love. We're trying to get back to the original kingdom. I sometimes wonder if the original kingdom is not the Garden of Eden, that it may look like that. We all have our image. But I do think that Eve got a pretty bad rap on being responsible for the original sin. I think there was a downfall of humankind, but I don't think it was just Eve. And I also think that we take that story and we use parts of it to try to oppress a part of our society, women in particular, which is wrong. And this is something we do with the Bible a lot. We turn it into a rule book. We take parts of it to try to reach an agenda that we want. And it's not the intent of the Bible. It is not what God's intend. Again, when we look in the mirror, we're seeing an image of God a creation of God, and God said it was good. Nowhere in God's creation did he say something was bad, and Eve was a culmination of God's creation. And I don't know how I'm stronger I can say that. We are all good. We are all loved by God. Whether we accept that or not, we are. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these times that you give us where you meet us where we are at, where you give us this opportunity to unpack your word, for us to look deep into its meaning and understanding, what your creation is about and what you are about, this incredible love. And we pray that you pour that love out onto us each day, and that your Holy Spirit moves through us, and that each day you give us a deeper and stronger understanding of what it means to be created in your image. And that we take that image and we put it forth in the world and doing your job for you. And that we shine your love out there and give us that strength because doing your work is never easy. There are so many things that stop us. Some of it's an outside force, but most of it's inside us. That battle that goes on every day and every minute and every second. We need your strength. We pray for it. We desire to be like you. We strive it. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Now we have come to the time in our service where we invite you to give of your fruits. 
This is always a hard time during the pandemic to be asking, particularly when we are doing our services through um, online streaming or Facebook um, and on, on, on uh, YouTube. There is a donation button that we, if you uh, feel so inclined to go ahead and, and push that and uh, give a small amount or a large amount to the church, whichever um, you feel. We have incredible ministries here at Langsburg United Methodist Church. Um, and we are continuing to try to um, move those ahead. Uh, so again, uh, we pray um, a prayer of thanksgiving for all that we give. Uh, Lord, please take these tithings that we have given today and to put them to use for your work. Uh, we pray that we continue to do the missions that you have looked forward in our community um, and have asked us to do uh, and uh, that we continue to serve you in the work that we do. Amen. We have now come to the moment in our uh, service tonight, today for our pastoral prayer and our guided prayer. Let's take a moment of silence. Lord, we want to thank you for allowing us to gather here today in this beautiful creation of yours, in this time that we have together. We ask that you hear our prayers, our prayers for our neighbors, be the in other lands, be those that are sitting next to us, be those in our government, both at national levels, in our state governments, in our local. We pray for those who are making decisions that impact all of us around us. We ask that you open their hearts and their minds for the unintended consequences that these decisions may have, particularly on those who are in need, those who are facing food shortages and home shortages. We ask that you open our hearts, that we see what our neighbors may need, how we may help, how we can be a loving neighbor, a helpful neighbor. We pray for those in our congregation, those who are in need of help, who have health issues. We ask that you guide their health care workers, for we know that you are the ultimate healing physician. Lift up the families. Know, help them know that you are with them, that you are carrying them that you have never left them. And most of all, Lord, we pray that you open our hearts to your Holy Spirit, that you continue to make our hearts grow with that unimaginable love that you have, and that you make us become more and more like you each day, and that you help us follow that commandment of loving you with all our heart, minds, and souls. It is a hard task. It is one that we fail at daily, but we can never stop trying to strive for and help us in that striving. Lord, help us to remember it is not the building of the church where you are at. You were there in the margins. You were out there with the people who need you the most. You are there with those who are crying, those who are in need, those that hurt, those who are silent in their needs, and those who are yelling. And Lord, there is so much hurt and so much anger around the world. It is overwhelming is beyond what one person can do. 
And sometimes I think that makes us just shut down. But keep with us. Help us realize that it just takes one kind thing and it has a domino effect. Please help us from becoming apathetic. Help us to remember that it, Jesus took one step, did one thing at a time, and that is all that you are asking us to do. And we pray these things through the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, everybody, big hands and big arms. May this week allow you to feel the Holy Spirit filling your heart with God's love. May you truly achieve the image of God and strive for it. Go out, show love, show mercy, show friendship. Be kind to your neighbor. God bless. Amen.